Buenos días, doctor Jorge Mota, Secretario Nacional de la Secretaría Nacional de Ciencia, Tecnología e Innovación. Señora Melanie Fedri, señor Michael O'Rourke, consultores internacionales invitados, señora Sacha Gerhardson de The Washington Center, autoridades universitarias, representantes de Ciudad del Saber, centros de investigación, embajadas, organismos nacionales e internacionales, egresados de la Iniciativa para la Innovación y la Competitividad, representantes de la CENACIT, invitados especiales. La Secretaría Nacional de Ciencia, Tecnología e Innovación CENACIT les da la más cordial bienvenida al Foro Emprendimiento, Emprendimiento Social e Innovación, que está organizado por la CENACIT y The Washington Center. Como primer punto en esta agenda tendremos las palabras del doctor Jorge Mota, Secretario Nacional de Ciencia, Tecnología e Innovación. Sí, buenos días a todas, a todos. Eh, quiero reiterar que en nombre de la CENACIT eh, les, doy esta, les damos esta bienvenida a todos a este eh, foro académico sobre emprendimiento e información, que es parte del compromiso que tenemos para, eh, en CENACIT para fortalecer, divulgar eh, y eh, fomentar la ciencia, la tecnología y la innovación en Panamá. Eh, la iniciativa de innovación y competitividad de Panamá Estados Unidos surge de un acuerdo entre Senacit y el Washington Center para incentivar eh, la difusión del conocimiento científico y tecnológico. Eh, y quiero hacer un poquito de historia aquí, porque vale la pena recordar que la primera, el primer acuerdo que se llegó a cabo fue en el 2012, y esto permitió a 14 estudiantes eh, universitarios participar en este programa eh, que, excluyó, que, que incluyó una estadía de 15 semanas en, en, en Washington. Eh, el segundo fue firmado en 2017 y benefició a 11 estudiantes y el tercero, eh, firmado el año pasado, benefició a 14 estudiantes, eh, en los cuales pudieron ser parte de esta valiosa experiencia. También hace un año se organizó el primer eh, foro académico, el cual permitió a más de 100 docentes, investigadores de universidades oficiales y privadas, eh, profesionales independientes, estudiantes, periodistas, ser parte de del evento y beneficiarse de él. Eh, en aquella ocasión se promovió la búsqueda de estrategias encaminadas a la colaboración entre la educación superior y el sector privado. Eh, como parte de la iniciativa hoy empezamos, nos reunimos eh, en un segundo foro académico eh, que está dedicado al fomento del emprendimiento social y la innovación, eh, y que también es organizado por eh, Sena City Washington Center. La segunda versión de este foro académico tiene eh, como objeto desarrollar diálogos sobre temas de innovación, competitividad, emprendimiento entre estudiantes académicos de universidades locales y representantes de los sectores productivos. Eh, se necesita esperar que el foro motive a moverse hacia nuevos espacios colaborativos que faciliten la incorporación de acciones que incentiven el emprendimiento para el beneficio de la sociedad. De igual manera, creemos que las contribuciones de este foro 
ayudarán a los estudiantes beneficiarios del módulo de desarrollo profesional del año pasado a contextualizar y afinar los proyectos que trabajan durante su estadía en el Washington Center y facilitará también la ejecución del segundo módulo del programa de desarrollo profesional cuya convocatoria está por ser presentada a, por el Washington Center. El sistema de innovación panameño necesita la formación de líderes dispuestos a trabajar en proyectos de innovación social para que afrontemos eh, desafíos apremiantes. Y lo que quiero decir por esto es que, eh, como saben, desde enero somos un país de ingresos altos y tenemos el Producto Interno Bruto per cápita más alto de Latinoamérica, con una dispersión gigante entre los que no tienen y los que tienen. Entonces, eh, proyectos como estos a nivel comunitario que inciden en la calidad de la vida de los panameños eh, se han sido los considero esenciales. Así que muchas gracias por estar aquí y por participar en, en, esta, en este proyecto. Agradecemos la intervención del doctor Jorge Mota y a continuación la señora Sacha Gerharson de The Washington Center presentará a los consultores internacionales invitados. Good morning. How is everyone doing? Good. Yeah, is everyone awake? <laughs> Um, well, thank you so much for having us here. Um, the Washington Center is super excited to be here. We are really passionate about this program. Um, we're going in, we just finished the second year um, of the latest three-year agreement, and the students are fantastic. Um, and so we're really excited about the forum component as well. Um, and so I'm just going to briefly go over the biographies of the two speakers for today and tomorrow. Um, so first, I'm going to invite up Mr. Michael O'Rourke. So Michael is the CEO and founder of Okra Labs, a software services company in Silicon Valley. Previously, Michael was an executive with, it, with Verizon, as well as founder of two technology product companies. In 2015, Michael founded Semplice, a technology company launching its flagship software product later in 2019. Michael is an avid reader of history and technology. He is particularly interested in the impact of technology in society. Michael holds a BS degree in systems engineering from InTech, an MBA from the University of Tampa, and is a fellow at the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. Michael lives with his wife in San Jose, California. Um, so Michael, if you could just provide a brief overview of, of kind of what you're going to be talking about tomorrow. Lo que yo quiero presentar, y, y yo estudio bastante el, el impacto tecnológico en la sociedad, y ustedes pueden ver el impacto tecnológico en la sociedad en diferentes sociedades en el mundo. Entonces, el acceso a tecnología desarrolla eh, eh, las sociedades. Eh, la creación de productos y servicios a través de tecnología eh, ayudan a, la, a las sociedades. Y mi intención, mi intención en los próximos días, dependiendo de cómo se vayan moviendo los grupos, es hablar de dónde salen las ideas primero, y eso hay que separarlo de lo que es la incubación de la idea. Entonces, ¿por qué ocurren las ideas? ¿Cómo Silicon Valley es un generador de, de tantas ideas? ¿Y por qué eh, Bangladesh no? Entonces, no es un tema solamente de dinero, es un tema... Que, que tiene mucho que ver de cómo se visualizan las cosas y luego crear la infraestructura social, política y económica para poder incubar esas ideas. Entonces, yo hago la separación de eso y yo voy a estar hablando eh, un poco mañana eh, sobre esa generación de ideas y obviamente una parte que ya viene siendo, eh, se viene haciendo hace un montón de tiempo es, bueno, se requiere tiempo, se requiere dinero y se requieren un montón de otras cosas para, para generar esas ideas. Entonces, yo quiero ver cómo, cómo los equipos de mañana en un workshop que tenemos, cómo se van moviendo para así ir ajustando el, 
el speech, pero el interés es, la especialización mía es tecnología, y como ustedes saben, la tecnología hoy día, eh, todo el mundo la tiene en un bolsillo, entonces, eso es un instrumento importante de generación de cambio social, no solamente redes, sino la utilización de tecnología para ayudar desde un punto de vista social a, a, a sociedades, países como Panamá. Eh, que la, la, como ustedes, si se van al, al, a la revolución industrial, en la revolución industrial tuvo un cambio importante, hubo un cambio de noche a día eh, en lo que es en el mundo de día y después tres eh, revoluciones adicionales eh, tecnológicas e industriales han ido cambiando. como son. Entonces hay un, un, un tema importante que lo que me gustaría comunicar es el tema de cómo visualizo una idea y por qué la estoy visualizando y luego cómo convierto eso, esa idea en un producto. Entonces, en los próximos días yo voy a estar acá, eh, cualquier tema que quieran conversar, es un tema muy amplio y lo que voy a tratar es ver si, si se llevan los estudiantes y los profesores, los líderes, se llevan un poquito de esa idea para ver si se puede hacer algo acá en Panamá. Entonces, lo, los veo en, en estos dos días por acá y cualquier pregunta que tengan, solamente me paran y, y hablamos un poco. ¿eh? Right. Thank you, Michael. Um, so Michael will be presenting tomorrow. And then today, we are very pleased to welcome um, Dr. Melanie Fedry, who is here with us. So Melanie, if you'll come on up. Um, so Dr. Melanie Fedry earned her PhD in higher education from Pennsylvania State University, where she completed a dissertation on curriculum change that integrates social entrepreneurship education into engineering. In addition to continuing her research on impact-focused education, Dr. Fedry designs and facilitates learning experiences on social entrepreneurship for organizations that include LearnServe International and the U.S. Department of State. She, serves a, she served as George Washington University's founding program manager for social entrepreneurship. In this role, Dr. Fedry managed the social venture track of the university's $200,000 new venture competition. Assisted by the programming and coaching she offered, student social entrepreneurship teams collectively won more than $210,000 to launch their ventures. One team she mentored, Means Database, received national televised recognition as top 10 CNN heroes of 2018. Dr. Fedry is also a University of Virginia graduate who has lived and worked overseas for four years, taking her from farm fields in India to diplomatic meetings in Israel to startup hubs in Kenya. All right, thank you so much for being here, Melanie. So a little bit more about me, just for a little fun and flavor. Um, I've done some research, as you can see, in Kenya, having a good time with students. I followed engineering students and students from across a university to understand how do they start and implement social ventures. Um, and these students did very amazing work. I will share a little bit more later. Um, and this. Students at the bottom, it's from a social innovation course I taught at George Washington University, where students got to do, I believe, what the Washington Center students in the room have done, or will get a chance to do if there are any applicants in the room, uh, which is to come up with proposals. So that was a one semester course. And um, my role at George Washington University, which ended in 2016, um, because it was on a special grant, um, uh, was to help the university meet obligations to the Clinton Global Initiative. So I had the pleasure of matching President Bill Clinton three years in a row, uh, representing the university. So that's just kind of a fun uh, tidbit, uh, some tidbits about me. So we will start by defining social entrepreneurship a bit for those in the room who want to hear a bit more about that. Um, so if you can tell me a little bit more about the kind of entrepreneurship that you see in the picture. Does anybody have any thoughts on, on what this might be? And more specifically, a better prompt. Imagine you're the founder of Uber. Go back in time to when this was just a beginning thought. And ask yourself, you know, what as that founder did you have to think about? And what did you have to do? Like on a high level. Um, or anything that comes to mind. So if anybody has ideas they'd like to share, kind of make this interactive. We're going to be doing a lot of interactive things today together. So what are some things that that person would have to do starting out? Any thoughts? Like what's one thing you would do? If you thought, hey, what if people could just take their private cars and start sharing them? Hmm, like what would, what would you think they'd have to do? Maybe some of the students, I'm assuming you've been exposed to this idea. Can I say something? Yes, please. Many years ago, 
Oh, <laughs> tell me about that. Yeah. So there's something in the country similar. Nice. Right. Right. So we are still uh, using radio taxis for many things. Right. In a better way than we use Uber. <laughs> Wow, that's wonderful. So there's some local innovation, we would say. It's a, well, it's yeah. local innovation. Local it's, innovation, It happens yeah. in lo many countries in Latin America, mm -hmm. I guess. Exactly, yeah. At least those sites which I know. <laughs> wonderful, thank you for sharing that. So um, some things on a high level that entrepreneurs have to do um, is they need to um, not only come up with a concept, but they need to uh, test that concept. They have to gather resources together, right? I mean, they needed to get money to launch this thing um, and marshal those resources, inspires others to give them those resources. And then they had to build a startup. And then beyond that, now they're moving into the phase of making their startup a mature business. You're correct with normal growth that people can predict. Regulatory things are always a problem for Uber, so I wouldn't say they're 100% there. But this is the flavor of, of what I will call commercial entrepreneurship. Sometimes people say traditional entrepreneurship. So um, I've got two things to forward here. So moving on, um, you may see the picture above. Does anybody recognize what this is, activity is? A very famous example. Mm -hmm. Microfinance, right, lending. Yep, Mohammed Yunus founded the Grameen Bank. So um, this is a different kind of entrepreneurship. And um, you know, what makes it different than, than the entrepreneurship at the bottom? Any thoughts? If no, if no thoughts, I'll share. So essentially, um, that, the entrepreneurs who, who do things like the above type of entrepreneurship, which is social entrepreneurship, spoiler alert, I'm giving it to you now, is that they also have to attend to creating social and or environmental good. So in, in my thinking, in many educators thinking, social entrepreneurs actually have a harder job than a commercial entrepreneur. And a commercial entrepreneur has a very hard job, right? It's very few startups succeed, on top of which doing social entrepreneurship well, it's even harder because for a commercial um, entrepreneur, you know, they, they look for their clear customer, the clear value, I'm going for customers who can pay me, great. You know, and that, again, difficult, but they can do it. Social entrepreneur, you may be trying to help in circumstances and customers that don't have money to pay as well or as handsomely as, as otherwise for commercial. So that's why it is a very challenging field um, and is very exciting as well because it's, it's a way that people are reimagining how to address social and environmental problems. So uh, going further, we call those wicked problems. That's a term that's been coined. Um, and so again, for commercial entrepreneurship, here's just an illustration for you that, you know, hey, if I notice people are out and about, you know, on camping or they're just, you know, in their cars driving and they get stranded or whatever's happening and they need a way to cut something and, you know, help themselves when they are just going about their lives, they may design something like this Swiss Army knife um, and be able to make a very simple solution, very clear customers again. And social entrepreneurship, we have a wicked problem, which means something that is very difficult to solve with a simple solution. Um, so, you know, poverty. If you're in a community, you say, I see poverty here, or I see the effects of climate change here. What is that one beautiful, simple solution? There probably isn't one, correct? So um, these are the wicked problems, as they say, of social entrepreneurship. So picking an area of a big problem to work on helps, and, and just having many different innovations and many different social entrepreneurs working together can really start to make the difference um, for those social and environmental issues. Everybody needs money in entrepreneurship. That's what makes it entrepreneurship, right? So you may have heard me say, I believe I mentioned it, that social entrepreneurship involves, um, typically involves coming up with a plan or an organization that might be financially sustainable or it might be low profitability. So, or, so I want to define what that is. Um, financial sustainability means that the organization, maybe it's trying to get, and we'll see examples, solar panels out there into the rural communities, 
or you know helping those uh, rec I don't know recent um, recently I don't know widowed mothers you know in rural areas all kinds of different possibilities you know endless possibilities of issues they are trying to address but as an organizational model if you're doing social entrepreneurship you at least want the organization to be financially sustainable meaning you can get donations and or sell a good or a service so that you can cover your costs. That is a bottom line requirement uh, for the definition of social entrepreneurship. Or you may be profitable, but it's a lower amount of return than a traditional um, investor would like to see. So there is actually a whole sector, which uh, and show of hands if people are familiar with impact investing. Has anybody heard of impact investing? I'm sure that read. So, what that is, is um, I'm not deeply immersed in it, but it is the, uh, a whole, um, I don't know, sector, you know, just like venture capital wants to invest in, in commercial entrepreneurship so they can get a nice fat return and make more and more money. Impact investors are actually very happy to work with social entrepreneurs who are doing, again, the low profitability model or maybe even losing money for them, but they're willing to take, they're willing to give out their money so that they can see those um, social and environmental returns. And I, at the bottom, I've included the one on, the, on your right, Pomona Impact is operational in, Latin, in Central America. And uh, they do give out, I think, around two to three million dollars a year. And they work and they have um, programs to help educate social entrepreneurs. Um, Agora is awesome. <laughs> they have a, one of their offices in DC, so I've known them for a long time. And they also work exclusively, as I understand, with Latin American social entrepreneurs. And they, again, education and funding. And then I wanted to mention Aspen Network of Development Entrepreneurs. Um, on your handout, um, there's a little bit more information, so you can track this down later. Um, but they are a network of organizations who support social entrepreneurs. So it's kind of, so you can see when you go there, like a lot of resources and a lot of names of organizations that support social entrepreneurs. So I highly recommend checking them out. So we are going to attempt uh, the video. I hope that the sound will work. This is um, Solubrite. They, are, they do operate in Panama. And this is going to give you a flavor of, of the money side, I guess you could say, if it works, of social entrepreneurship and how much you need to be attending to that concern. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Henrik. I'm the founder of Solubrite. And out of 45 million people in Central America, 7 million still live in energy poverty. Our mission is to provide solar energy to rural people in Central America. And our goal is to get 250,000 of those individuals out of energy poverty by 2020. We have made a lot of progress towards our goal. Today, Solubrite distributes a wide range of products from solar lamps all the way up to solar freezers and bigger systems. In the last three years, we have impacted the lives of 46,000 individuals, and we have doubled our revenues each year. None of this would have been possible without an amazing team of local and international employees with years of experience on the ground and an in-depth knowledge of in-country logistics, distribution, and sales. We're very proud of what we have done, but we also realize that we've only scratched the surface of energy poverty in Central America. And a key factor is the high upfront cost of quality solar products. So we asked ourselves, how can we make our products more affordable and get them even to more remote regions. Also, how can we create a relationship with our customers so that we can ensure the affordability, the support, and the after sales service at the community level? In effect, what we really want to do is build long-term relationships with communities as they climb up the energy ladder and out of energy poverty. Our current model is B2B. We sell to MFIs, uh, NGOs, regional retailers. But in order for us to achieve 
our goal and in order for us to achieve greater impact, we need to extend our sales network to the last mile and incorporate sales agents who will sell the products at the village level. We also need to expand our product line to include pay-as-you-go products that will enable even the most financially vulnerable to afford them. Let me explain briefly how pay-as-you-go works. Pay-as-you-go is a technology that gets embedded in the product and the purchase of the product is done through incremental small payments. Once all the payments have been made, then the client fully owns the product. If a payment isn't made, then the technology locks the product and it's unusable until the next payment unlocks it. All the payments are done through a local village agent who manages and logs the payments in a simple smartphone. We're very excited about this technology, and the reason why is because we, it will allow us to benefit our clients with ever more impactful products. And so we envision a world where a villager or a community will slowly climb the energy ladder of a small lamp progressively and graduate to a solar fridge, for example. And so we see this as impacting the whole community. We have a five-year plan to get to our goal. In the first phase, we need to validate the pay-as-you-go model in order to bring in a financing partner. So we need to collect the data. In phase two, once the model is validated and we have brought on a financing partner, then we can start growing and going to phase three, which is scaling the pay-as-you-go model. Our revenues reflect our plan. Our B2B business is growing steadily and the pay-as-you-go is a modest growth at the beginning while we're validating the model. And then once we have brought on a financing partner, then we can start growing. And in 2018, really start scaling. We're seeking 400,000 in investment in two tranches. We want to close 150,000 in grant funding in order to do the pilot, the pay-as-you-go pilot. And we want, in 2018, to get another 250,000 to expand the sales network and to scale the pay-as-you-go model. I invite you to join me and my team in trying to get 250,000 individuals in Central America out of energy poverty. And thank you very much. That was sponsored by, I believe, Agora, and they had another organization there. So again, getting those skills and getting the opportunity to get funding to really start to scale up what they are trying to do to make, to make the world better in this regard. So I want to move on a little bit and just not to splice hairs too much, um, but to explain the difference between social innovation and social entrepreneurship. It's becoming a more distinct um, difference. Uh, they are very closely related, so it's not oppositional or anything, it's just, just to be clear. So as you can see on, the, on your left, that this is a prototype, which is a, something that gives you, we're going to do a little bit of prototyping later, but something that gives you a feeling for a, an, a solution, right? It's not a finished product. You can tell that the students had, you know, just used simple materials. These are engineering students. Um, so they're building a scale to weigh babies in rural places. So social innovation is more about um, just trying to get your um, progress around an initial idea, not so much worrying about the business or the organization that you will wrap around that eventually. And on, the, on your right, that is the same students working um, on that second part to actually do social entrepreneurship. And this is the, the students running a, a clinic um, pilot out in rural Kenya. And in terms of everything you know, about the money in that bottom line and that concern for that, they were trying to see if villagers are willing to pay a small, number, a small amount of money to receive a screening because their hypothesis, their idea was that 
a lot of times villagers don't know when they need to take the time and the money, the transport, also losing the day wage, et cetera, to go to a clinic, right? That costs them money. So they're thinking if we can charge a smaller amount, they can see, you know, be able to talk to a nurse virtually or get feedback about their vital signs. Do I need to go in to the city to get that um, care or can I just, you know, do something more sim simple? So they're testing that as well as finding other ways to support their venture. And they found out that the Kenyan government was very excited because they had no data about the health of people in these rural places. And I went with them to do this testing and it was kind of funny because these rural places were about 10 minutes away from like, a, like a, a town center, but to the government that was like very rural. So they were excited to support and more pilots that the government itself carried forward for like an additional year beyond the summer that the students spent. So as you can see, this, the difference is you know, between just the core innovation and then actually trying to wrap that in something that can be financially sustainable or viable. So moving on, um, talking about how difficult it is for social entrepreneurs to meet those multiple bottom lines of financial viability as well as the social and environmental um, impact. So what are some ways that, they, that a lot of social entrepreneurs do that? So this picture gives you a clue. What is, what is something that seems to be in common here? You can just think about it for a minute. Um, yeah, there's things that are food and things that are simple and things that others view as trash, literally, <laughs> um, and something that's undervalued. So a lot of social entrepreneurs will take undervalued or even literal trash of other people that it costs money, right? You have to pay somebody to take your trash away as a negative value and they turn it into something that is valuable. So this is, I'm emphasizing that this is a way that a social entrepreneur can manage to do this very difficult thing harder than commercial entrepreneurship. So um, here are some examples of, you know, what I was thinking when I gave those. Um, so one, the one on the left is TerraCycle, TerraCycle, and they take trash, they collect this certain kinds of trash that in the US they do not recycle. We do not recycle our you know, chip bags or our um, you know, juice boxes and things that kids use. And so they ask you to collect them in your schools or at home and mail it to them. They'll give you the label and then they turn it into products that they sell in very large stores like Walmart and Target and other such large stores. Um, the one in the middle, there's actually a lot of companies. So this one, I don't know if it's still operational, but um, the ugly fruits and vegetables. There's, as you may know, a large percentage of, of produce, fruits and vegetables that people, uh, farmers have to just throw away because it's too ugly to land up in the marketplace. So there's a lot of activity. I designed a two-week course around food entrepreneurship. Um, so we, we visited about three or four different um, startups, social ventures working in this space to take ugly fruits and vegetables and turn it into something of value. So one that I'm thinking of here is Surplus. And they're working in California and they're taking the ugly fruits and vegetables and creating an online, almost like when you go, you know, I don't know, Amazon or something, something like this, where chefs um, can buy for a, a relatively low amount these uh, ugly fruits and vegetables for a cheaper amount. And they don't care, right? They're gonna chop it up and turn it into something beautiful. So that's one idea. Another idea is something called um, a Misfit Juicery based in DC. They're taking these again, pressing them into these fancy juices that they sell in the store for quite a profit. But the idea is that's an environmental benefit. Um, they are selling to wealthy people because they're expensive, but it is giving that environmental benefit. You're not wasting that food. And the last one is a little different vibe to it, but um, a student that I worked with and got to interview in high school, she thought about, um, she was very interested in computer programming and computer science, and uh, she started to volunteer when she was 14 years old with uh, younger children, teaching them about coding. And there was a program that MIT University developed to help kids learn programming. Um, and she realized that in a low-income school, it wasn't very easy to do this because there were not many computers. So what she, and also there were so many choices that it was difficult for the kids to really learn quickly. Um, so she realized she can literally take cardboard and make little pieces. I'm not a programmer, my husband is, but anyway, uh, cardboard and kind of help them with simpler lessons. And that way you, they, she could go into any school, 
a rural place, you know, a low-income place, and, and start teaching coding very easily and manageably. Um, so that's cardboard coders, is what her venture was called. Um, another way that social ventures can meet their multiple bottom lines is playing with the business model, playing with that organizational model. So we have for-profits like Solubrite, which is trying to ups upsell to you know, bigger, better, and very useful, of course, products in a for-profit model. A nonprofit would be something like Means Database, which I will see a little highlight in a moment of what they do, but uh, essentially allowing donations to come in and support, and then, but doing something in a unique and um, imaginative way. And then the hybrid model, which is having both the ability to take in donations as well as something that makes money. So that's DC Central Kitchen, and again, we will watch a very short video in a little bit about exactly what they do. When I go into a food pantry or a soup kitchen, I see opportunity. Hungry people can't think. You can't strategize about getting a job, about finding higher paying employment, about continuing your education, about taking care of your kids. You can't think about any of those things if you haven't eaten anything today. There are 49 million Americans that we've identified as being food insecure. We have more than enough food in this country to feed everybody. The challenge is we waste 40% of our food. If we could reorient that waste to get it to people in a timely, efficient, and safe way, we could end food insecurity. When I was 14, I was in eighth grade, and I would spend a lot of time volunteering at the food pantry. Most of the other volunteers were much older than I was, and our dumpster was outside. I am from Iowa, we get ice. And if anybody ever had to go throw something away, I would offer to do it. We were throwing food away because we were given donations that we couldn't use. It was incredibly difficult to tell people in the next town over that we had a bunch of free food that we would like to give them. And it blew my mind that that was a difficult conversation to have. I thought, but we have the internet. Why don't we use it to talk to each other? <laughs> and the week after I graduated high school, I met Grant. And everything changed. She looked over at my computer screen because I was sitting there working on a coding project. And she said, oh, can you code? My initial reaction when Maria Rose pitched the idea to me was that surely this is not a problem that phones have not already solved or that the email system can't solve. But what no one had built was a nationwide database that made it easy for food banks or people with extra food to simply say, I have food, here's what it is, which nonprofit wants it. So we set out to build that. Welcome to Means. We are an online platform for food pantries. They tell us where they are, what they need, and how far they're willing to travel to get it. And anytime anybody's got it, whether that's a restaurant, or a grocery store, or another food bank. We let them know about it via text or email, or both, and it's all free. Maria clearly had a passion for making a difference in the fight against hunger. But more importantly, she had an idea and she had acted on it. For a generation, good people working in food banks have thrown away food. Maria was the first person I met that went about actually solving the problem of that internal food waste within the hunger fighting movement. We're now working with more than 800 individual organizations in 45 states. We're helping move thousands of pounds of food a month, both from retailers and in between food pantries, food that otherwise would have ended up in the trash. Prince George's County, Maryland is approximately 15 to 20 miles from our nation's capital, Washington, DC. However, a lot of the residents still suffer with food insecurity and not having the money to buy food. Good to see you, as always. We have an event where we were inviting the entire community, and we had to pre-bag 7,000 lunch bags that included some perishable items. 
and the event was a rainy day event, so our projected attendance was not where we thought it would be. And we had to find a way to dispose of 3,600 lunch bags. I contacted Maria Rose, and within hours, those bags were claimed. The food pantry that claimed that they were going out on the streets of uh, Washington, D.C. and in Maryland and feeding the homeless. If we didn't have the means database, the bags of food would have gone in the dumpster. I understand what it is to go to the refrigerator and it's just the light bulb on. I understand what that is because I have gone to bed hungry as a child. What Maria brought to the table was that passion, that caring, that nuanced understanding of people in need that we see in the nonprofit sector and blended it with the innovation, the strategic approach, and the data-driven philosophy that we now prize in the for-profit sector. If we had a crisis that was affecting one in six Americans that was strongly associated with not finishing high school, not going to college, that was strongly associated with bad health outcomes, with mortality, with incarceration, with behavioral health issues. If we had a crisis that was doing that to one in six of us, we would be freaking out. And that's exactly what hunger is. It's not gonna be easy and it's not gonna be quick, but we can fix this and we should. So this um, uh, organization is the one that was um, recognized as a CNN hero, Maria Rose. Um, she was working in this, this area of hunger since she was, I think she said, 14. And uh, so again, young people can make a big difference. And uh, this is when they were pitching for their initial money that I helped coach them. They don't need me anymore, they're off to bigger and better things, but at that time that was very critical. Um, so this is where they won their initial $40,000. Um, they, they came in first place, I will brag. So at the university I worked at, I think this is pretty unique. They had the ability, they allowed, they had a competition, this large competition. It's up to $300,000 of value, like $200,000 in cash, $100,000 in other prizes. I don't know where they're finding this money, clearly the business partners. It's a ridiculous amount. It's not required that you ever have such a large um, competition, to be frank. But all the same, in this competition, they allow social ventures to go up head to head against the um, commercial ventures. So this is my second year working there, and this is a social venture, clearly, and it won, even though the judges were very much about, you know, the private market and not very necessarily sympathetic, but they were very, um, I guess, attracted to the fact that it was, that she was using, and her, her team was using technology to solve this problem, which is a huge problem, um, to help, you know, move food that would be thrown in the garbage to very um, finding places where it's needed. So another way to word this problem, which is kind of crazy, is she would say like, if you are a food pantry, you're feeding the homeless, and you need a salad for the evening meal, literally before this existed, they would just pick up the phone and call a couple random people they thought might have salad, which clearly is not effective, right? They're very busy, they don't have a lot of resources. So this is a way online, they can just click online or ask for notifications when someone near me has food, say, do I want it? Yes, I want it, and they go and they go get it. So this is really the essence of what it's solving and then and I just wanted to share a little bit more about my experience helping this team. Does anybody heard of Tom's Shoes or One for One Models? Yes, okay, so your challenge now you're probably going to guess what I'm going to say, but do you think this is social entrepreneurship? You can, you can discuss. I hear some yeses, I see some noes. Um, but basically, this is when, for those not familiar, when if you buy one of this, I will give that same thing or similar to somebody in need. So Tom's Shoes originally would give, you know, if you buy a pair of shoes in the United States or wherever, um, they would go donate a pair of shoes to somebody in a developing country. So. The answer to this, and when you judge competitions like I've had to do, it becomes difficult sometimes to distinguish a commercial venture from a social venture. However, I would argue, and many experts argue, that this is not social entrepreneurship um, because uh, all judgments aside about you know, charity models and sometimes disrupting local 
you know, local markets. If you're flooding a market with shoes in a developing country, that may not be good for certain people who make their money selling shoes, but um, et cetera. All that aside, very specifically, you're, if you're able to give your core value without that social benefit, then you're not a social venture. So they could continue to sell these shoes just fine in the United States. What they actually do operationally is make these nice shoes. And so that whole, like, I'm giving away the shoe is marketing. It may be very nice. It may be very helpful to their brand. Um, philanthropy is not necessarily bad or charity. However, it's important to realize that we want to push our students um, and folks in our community to think a little harder about if they're a social venture. So for instance, I had commercial entrepreneurs coming up to me saying, hey, if I just donate a little money, can I be a social venture? That's a whole other sector, right? That's, that's charity, which is in philanthropy, which is good, but it isn't social entrepreneurship. That's the only point I wanted to make there. Um, so we're moving on to discussing social entrepreneurship as a process, which I'm very passionate about. I wrote a 333-page book, no graphs, that was my dissertation, um, about the process of social entrepreneurship, um, primarily, of course, around curriculum. But really, I think that's the essence of what social entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship is, right? Um, there's an idea of measuring, you know, in a society how much money, how much entrepreneurship is happening. You think about Silicon Valley, um, you know, in the U.S. and that sort of thing. You can measure just success. But what's really exciting for us is to think about the process because that's really what is exciting and engaging. Um, as we try to tackle these very difficult problems. So I'm just gonna highlight a few things that I, I find really um, interesting and a couple of takeaways for you all. So the first thing I wanna um, emphasize is unlike most of our collegiate experience studying in university where things kind of go a little bit in order and very linear, in entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship, we are dealing with a very messy, iterative process. So iterative meaning we go back over and over again, ideally, to challenge what we tried, challenge what we think, um, and you should expect to do that. Um, and what you're doing uh, is, is um, creating, trying to search for a solution market fit is really what you're trying to do because all these pieces are going and you need to find something that will align. Um, Market just means people want it, you know? And then the solution is, of course, how are you going to do that, attending, again, to your financial and social bottom line. And while that seems extremely obvious, the top reason that um, any startup fails is there is no market need. Nobody wanted what you offered. So you may have poured your blood, sweat, and tears into it, but maybe because you weren't going back and challenging how you think about it over and over again, learning all of the time from people that you want to have as your customer or as your beneficiary. Because you didn't do that, you could spend time and money and nobody wants what you're selling. Nobody wants what you're providing, necessarily. Um, this is the business model canvas. Has anybody in the room seen this before? This is kind of a cartoony version of it. So a business model canvas also could be an organizational model canvas if you're not a business, if you're a nonprofit. It's the same concerns. The heart of this, there are nine pieces. This is borrowed from Lean, L-E-A-N, Lean Startup. Um, that should be on your handout somewhere. This is mentioned, this, tech, this kind of approach to entrepreneurship. So please uh, learn more if you're interested. But the Lean Startup method um, looks at these nine blocks and the core of it is the value proposition that you see in the middle and the customers. Um, so what you're doing is spending, when you first start out wanting to do a social venture or any venture, you really wanna to talk to your customers, figure out who your customers are, and then think what value can I bring them, right? So look around, what value are other people bringing them? Can I do better than what they're already being um, given? Right? So that you spend a lot of time there, and, and then you can build out the other things. How do I reach them? What kind of relationship will I have with them? Who are my partners? These are all the other blocks, right? What are my expenses? How will I make money? Um, and the key thing there is to realize that when you write this down on a piece of paper, and you can download it off the internet, there's a million versions of this available, the business model canvas. You realize that everything you write down is a guess, it's a hypothesis, and you need to test 
and not just assume that it's going to work that way. Um, and you can test that um, through some methods, um, through interviews, through observations, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Another part of social entrepreneurship is searching for the right question. This is borrowed from design thinking, if people have heard of design thinking. And um, this is a very poignant quote from Albert Einstein. If I had an hour to solve a problem and my life depended on it, I would use the first 55 minutes determining the proper question to ask. For once I know the proper question, I could solve the problem in less than five minutes. So if Einstein wants to take his hour to save his life, 55 minutes on the question he should be asking, maybe we should also consider spending more time than we typically do, seeing are we asking the right kind of question. If we want to solve these difficult social environmental problems, we have to ask different questions or ask these questions in a different way. Here's an example. Um, you see on, on, on your left, how do we feed people in this line? And you see on your right, how might we shorten the line? So as you look at that, just think about which question do you think will lead to more innovation and lead uh, to more social benefit and social good? So while it might seem obvious that the question on the right is a little bit more poignant and more useful, um, I'm not showing this to be gimmicky or to kind of just say, oh, mm -hmm, nice story. This is actually what the founder of DC Central Kitchen, which we'll share, I will share a little bit more, a little clip so you can see him and hear what it does in depth in a moment. But uh, Robert Egger, who's arguably the most successful social entrepreneur in America, uh, in, the, in the 1970s, he was a young man and he was a bouncer for a nightclub in DC and he went with a friend, I guess he was invited, at night to go and help hand out food to the homeless in Washington, D.C. And he noticed that every night they would go and they would, be, they would feed the same people. The volunteers knew everyone's name. And so, you know, in that model, people are thinking, how do we feed all these people? While he said, and he's known for expletives and cursing, so I won't curse, but he's like, why doesn't this line get any shorter? So... He really, that was the impetus to start this very successful social venture, um, which does training for people who have, were formerly incarcerated or homeless. Um, they produce food, you'll hear more about it. They produce three million meals a year. Um, they give some of these meals away to homeless shelters and they sell some of these meals to the school system, for instance. Here at DC Central Kitchen, we prepare three and a half million meals each year for our community, and we distribute them through partnerships with homeless shelters, halfway houses, frontline nonprofits, and even schools. Uh, but our mission is all about using food as a tool. We know food alone will never end hunger, because hum hunger is a symptom of poverty. So we're training men and women with barriers to employment. They may have faced incarceration, addiction, homelessness, or trauma in the culinary arts, and helping them get jobs all through our city's hospitality sector. But we're also hiring graduates of our training program to work here. We actually employ 77 graduates of this training program at living wages with comprehensive health and retirement benefits to serve all of those three and a half million meals. So that creates a win-win scenario. We're putting people back to work, we're feeding people in need, and we're even preventing the waste of almost two million pounds of otherwise wasted food through our work here in DC and recruiting college students to replicate our program nationally. So why don't you give me a little bit of a tour here? Okay. Well, Where are we, first of all? Where are we and what are we doing? Well, we're in the basement of the biggest shelter in America, um, which is where the DC Central Kitchen Shop is. We're right down the hill from the Capitol. And what we're about to do is walk into our kitchen here, where on any given day we produce roughly 5,000 meals that go out to city shelters, to um, after school programs, to drug clinics, anywhere. What we're trying to do is help people heal physically by getting nutritious food, but we're also trying to create kind of an economic way by giving agencies the power to don't have to buy their food. 
you know, if they don't have to buy food, they can use their money to liberate people. And we've really been very deliberate about where the food goes. We don't want to just give food away. We want to empower systems. So we've chosen very deliberate partners in the community that I think share our sense of, again, this should be a liberation movement, not a way to hold people where they're at. So what we do every day, and you'll see, is engage um, usually between 40 and 60 volunteers, men and women in the class. Um, this is class 83 right now. Um, men and women who've graduated who are now employees. And as you'll see, what we're doing is producing the better part of about 5,000 meals. Right. So, um, you know, again, it's, just a, it's, it's an engaging process that um, takes advantage of stuff that used to be thrown away. I mean, that's our whole bag, man. Everything we use here was already here. You know, we take food our society threw away, people our society undervalued, a kitchen that was vacant, um, volunteers who wanted to be part of something powerful, um, chefs who had food but also would help teach, agencies that wanted to empower people. All that was there, man. We just reorganized reorganize existing ingredients. And that's the key, I think, to the future is not how do we buy more, build more. It's like, what are we using? And is there a way to use it differently and more powerfully? So, anyway, man, come on, we'll take a look. You know, uh, one of the favorite so that um, is Robert Edgar, the founder, and so just to emphasize what he was saying is a little noisy, that he's taking existing ingredients, that's another thing entrepreneurs do, that find what are the resources in the environment and how can you rearrange their relationship. So he took, as he said, people who have been undervalued, those who came out of prison, those who have been homeless, and makes, helps, them, helps them become valuable with the job training. He takes other things that were undervalued, like the food that would otherwise be thrown away. We keep hearing about food, but of course there are many topics in social entrepreneurship, but this is an, a very relatable one. That's why I keep sharing it. Um, but food that would otherwise be thrown away and create something that is of use. Um, and also he mentioned chefs in the city who are willing to become teachers. Um, and, and other resources, uh, an empty uh, kitchen that they were able to fill. So he's talking about rearranging those relationships and not always thinking I have to build from scratch. So I think that's a very powerful uh, lesson from that. So again, going with asking the right question, it goes along with how you approach. So this is a little, a little um, exercise for you. So if someone said, I need to get across this river, you're a social entrepreneur, you're just, you're, you're just innovative, like how would you help them get across that river? Maybe, maybe just, yeah, maybe get a boat, go across on the boat, get a boat, those kind of things, right? The reason you want to ask why several times is, maybe the reason, if you say, oh, you need to get across this river, I'm going to give you a boat, I'm going to build you a bridge. Awesome, we solved it. But if you ask why, even one time, what if the person said, oh, I need to get a message across? That's different, right? So now you realize, maybe I just need to extend Wi-Fi or a cellular signal out there, because need, they, need they don't need to physically cross, they just need the message to get across. And that's a radically different solution. So that's a small example of why you want to keep asking why. Um, and I want to give the example of Aravind Eye Care System or Aravind Eye Hospital in India. I don't know if anybody's heard of this organization, but it's, again, a, an older, very um, successful social venture. So it was founded in India by somebody, his name is very long, his, but his nickname was Dr. V. And Dr. V visited, visited the United States, and he did something I also recommend that social entrepreneurs do, which is look at interesting models that you just see out and about in the world and think how can I kind of learn from that interesting model that's doing something very cool in its space, in its market. Is there anything cool and interesting I can bring over to my social venture? So what he did is he was very excited about McDonald's. And he was a doctor, you know, back in India. But he came to the US and he was obsessed. He could not believe the efficiency of McDonald's. So what he did is designed a hospital to do eye surgeries that was modeled with the efficiency of McDonald's. So um, as you see in the image, the surgeons there are working. They created a system so that today they do 1,200, they see 1,200 patients a day across their system and they do over 200 surgeries a day, which is way, and they have, I've looked at all the data, they're, and they're studied in business schools and all kinds of places. They um, have better outcomes, 
you know, top surgeons from around the world will come to this hospital to do their residency in this area. Very highly regarded. There's no difference in care if you are wealthy or if you're poor. And it's so efficient that the length of time between is almost literally as much time as it takes to swing that, you know, scope to the next patient because they have everybody lined up and ready to go. And then they swing and then they move on again to the next eye surgery. So they're very efficient, almost like those hamburgers in the line at McDonald's. Um, but beyond that amazingness when they, of, that, of that achievement on the technical side, when they started, they said, we want everybody, and this is a choice as a social entrepreneur that they made, we want everyone to get these services. We want the rich, we want the poor, and they considered it a sliding scale. So if you're wealthy, you pay the full price, and then anything in between, whatever you can pay, down to zero. And they thought people who paid no money were still their customer, and they still wanted those customers. So they said, we have free services here in the city. You happen to live in a village, but come here and get our free services, because they're free. But when they talked to, but then they realized nobody was coming, or not many people were coming. So when they talked to this moment, is this is a, for instance, this old man who is 80 years old, and they said, well, why aren't you coming? They could have given up and said, I guess they don't want to come here. It's too much trouble. Fine. We'll just focus on everybody else that are in the city, dwellers, or, or whatever. But when they asked this, this um, gentleman, he said, you tell me your service is free, but to get to the hospital, I need bus fare. Once I get there, I need accommodation. I need food. I need medicine. I need return transportation. I'm 80 years old, I can't go alone. If my son comes with me, he loses his day wage. Your free service costs me 100 rupees. So that was an assumption. Remember I mentioned, write down your assumptions. They assumed they'll just come. They found out by asking why and talking with the people they want to help that indeed there were other things going on, right? With their behavior and their preferences and their ability to do what they thought, the entrepreneur thought they would do that they needed to consider. So what do you think the hospital did? Just take a moment to think about what you would do if you were told this and you're Dr. V. Um, so what they did was pretty amazing. Um, they started to have vans that would go out to the rural areas. They would do the screenings. Uh, and then the, you know, once they identified the people who needed the care, they would give them everything he needed. The transportation, the lodging, the medicine, the care, return them back home, and then also follow-up appointments. They would send well-trained um, staff to go back out and check on them, et cetera, um, all at zero cost to them, potentially. Because again, that was part of their mission, and they were able to cover the costs because of the higher paying customers. So this, this is called customer discovery. Um, customer discovery, there's some great book that I mentioned uh, by Cindy Alvarez. It's on your handout. Highly recommend that book. It's very practical. And it gives you, and this is a big part of, by the way, um, I would teach this at university over and over again. And again, people even in commercial entrepreneurship are teaching this as cutting edge, which is to say to potential customers, tell me about the last time you tried to do X. What was hard about that? And you get the feedback, you know, what, or maybe even like what was good about that, what was hard about that, and um, really trying to get their lived experiences. You're not trying to sell them something like, would you pay me money to go do this or whatever? It's it's because would you? It's like this is a whole area we could do a whole other workshop. So I don't want to get stuck in, into this world. But please look up more about this process. It's really interesting and it's amazing how working with the um, National Science Foundation in the United States, I've been able to work with some of those programs and working with, again, this is commercial entrepreneurs, but you know, brilliant professors designing new technologies, working with MBA students or whomever to try to think how can we commercialize. All the same, begging them, please, in this program to teach them lean startup, begging them to talk to people. Entrepreneurs often don't want to talk to anybody because I think they feel like I'm afraid what if my assumptions are wrong? But you need to embrace that you probably are wrong and go ahead and talk with people. So a big part of their training, honestly, is asking these simple, training them to go out and ask these very simple questions and asking them every week, you need to do 20 of these interviews and then come back and have 100 interviews done and what did you learn? So it's about insight, not about selling your idea. 
you want to get insights. Another way to get insights is to prototype and to pilot test. So uh, prototyping, we're going to, uh, our activity together will be kind of a modified prototyping. But that means creating something that gives a user or a customer a feeling of what you might ultimately make without spending all of the time and money that others might otherwise, you know, just say, okay, build this very complicated thing, or like, let's run this huge program, and then we'll see what we'll evaluate after. It's the opposite, which is to say, take some cardboard, kind of like that baby scale, right? Take cheap materials, build something that just feels like what the solution might be. If it's a service, maybe you do a skit. So I worked with students, again, in the rural areas in, in, in um, Kenya, they would do a skit be like, what if this is our solution to help you dehydrate your vegetable or your fruits that are left over from your crops? And like, show them the skit and say, what do you think of this? If you want to write down a key question and we're going to do it together, what do you think of this? And you listen for whatever insight they might be able to give you. Um, so that's the pilot testing idea. So borrowing from Tom Chi, I have that written down on your handout. He's got some really great videos about proto uh, prototyping. Um, and he comes from Google, so Google's innovation lab, he helped found that. Um, so he's saying, what are you really trying to learn? Because people are used to these very long cycles to figure out what did we learn. So he's saying, what are you really trying to learn and can you get this learning done in an hour or in a short period of time, not years and years and hundreds of thousands of dollars later? So, so just to go a little bit into what usually happens when you develop a product or service is you just say, you know, okay, we're over here right now. And here's all the things we could create. So let's, uh, somebody in charge will say, we're going to shoot for this bot right here, whatever this product is or service. And everyone just works to build that one thing, right? But again, you're losing the opportunity to do a lot of learning. So what is recommended is that you do a lot of little experiments. You develop a lot of prototypes. You ask a lot of questions. Again, the prototype can literally be cartoons, there's a lot of different things that can be prototypes, to be clear. It can be a physical model, it can be little cartoons, stick figures, like you come in the door, this happens, that happens, and then you know at the end this is your experience. It can be a skit, it can be a, like a little um, dialogue where you just explain in words like what I was just saying without the pictures, you can do that. Um, there's a lot of different things that can, it can be a flyer, like hey would you come to this event if you saw this flyer? all different kinds of things. That's what those little X, X's are, are little experiments, little prototypes or pilot tests that you can run that are quick and cheap. And then he uses the term constellate, so kind of think of all the learnings that you have gotten from all these little experiments and interviews. And then that helps to inform, we're actually gonna build this other thing. And then you go back and you keep learning, right? So this is the idea behind rapid prototyping or prototyping um, and to illustrate this in, in the commercial sense, if you've seen this movie where like he's able to just push with his gesturing, it was very revolutionary at the time, but gesturing to move the, um, the boards, uh, Google was asked to help them develop that. So, you know, how would you, how long do you think it would take to give somebody a feeling of doing this where you just move your hand and the screen in front of you just, you know, zips away? You know, probably you would think it would take a while. But what they are able to do at Google was to spend less than a day, just a few hours. I don't fully grasp it, but you can see they're using very simple materials, fishing line, a board, um, chopsticks, you know, binder clips, and they're able to have these uh, hair bands put around the wrists and give uh, people this feeling of moving the board. But what they noticed was, you know, from people doing this, they got excited, but they noticed they started doing like this. You know, so what does that mean? It means this is too big of a motion, right? So without building a whole, you know, million dollar prototype, they could learn quickly, we have to adjust so they can do smaller motions, not this really big arm motion that'll make their shoulders tired. So this is just one small physical product example of how quickly you can get um, insights. And here are some prototypes for social entrepreneurship. The one on the top left is in Zimbabwe, this actually just came in my email a couple days ago from Lean Startup, uh, the folks who started uh, Lean Startup, Eric Reese um, and company. And this is uh, 
solar panels in rural clinics in Africa. And instead of spending a lot of money, uh, they decided, and they're working with a development agency from, I think, Britain, Britain to help with this, um, to do a huge rollout. They said, we're gonna do a complete pilot in two locations. And they learned that um, when they did not dust off the panels, it would reduce the efficiency of the solar panels 30%, which is a lot. So what they realized is, this is the picture of them handing the clinic operator um, a bucket and a mop, specifically only for this task, to dust it off regularly. Because they actually tried just saying, just dust it off, and they would not dust it off. So they had to like, their next step, and maybe this won't work either, but this was their next step, was let's try giving them an actual dedicated, you know, uh, mop and bucket to keep the solar panels clean. Um, on the upper right, I didn't mention them yet, but I worked with another team that worked on mental health training for high school students in the United States. Um, again, they won a sizable amount of money from our competition, and their prototype was, they call this their baby, it was a big binder of materials. They created lessons from existing from existing materials on mental health, right? Like how to help young people deal with anxiety or stress or depression. So they did this in, as a high schooler, uh, high, as high schoolers, a team of high schoolers, they created this big binder, you know? And from that, they were able to start piloting. They asked teachers in high schools, can I come and do my little, you know, my little program? And they learned, and now they have a whole venture that is training people in mental health first aid and, and developing a, more slim um, their own curriculum instead of borrowing from other people's curriculum. And then the bottom left, I just wanna show like you can do paper prototypes, you can even do screens if there's a technology element. All you have to do is just draw pictures, you know? And then you can take that uh, little cardboard uh, phone and move it over like, or show like, then this screen pops up or you can just point um, or put pieces of paper on top of each other. Okay, you hit this button, this pops up. You hit this button, this pops up. So it's very quick. You don't have to be an amazing artist, just enough to get the idea. And again, we've been talking about the baby scale. For biomedical students, we're working on that. So those are just a few things to wrap up. Um, and uh, for things about the process, process of social entrepreneurship, again, it's very much about trying to understand your assumptions, talking to people, doing quick and cheap um, experiments um, or pilot tests to get those insights. And by the way, that's very key. If you're looking for investors, you need to do something. I know with Solubrite, we saw they wanted hundreds of thousands of dollars, and perhaps they're, it sounds like they're at that stage they can get that money. But when you're first starting out, you don't need hundreds of thousands of dollars. You could probably do a lot of this for free or very cheap. And that's important because nobody will Generally, nobody will give you money if you have done nothing on your idea. Everyone has a good idea, but you need to start validating it, right? You need to start talking to people and saying, we spoke, we went to this place, we spoke with 100 people, and this is what we learned about their needs. Not that we sold our, our idea to them, but this is what we learned about their needs. And then we ran this pilot, and this is what we learned from the pilot. You know, we need the mop in the bucket, and now we're asking for our $100,000 or we're asking for our $20,000 or whatever it is you need. So start small and then that actually helps you get more support. My name is Melanie Fedry and um, I have a doctorate studying higher education and social entrepreneurship. And my workshop was about what is social entrepreneurship its definition, its relationship to commercial entrepreneurship, to social innovation, also to look at the process of what social entrepreneurship entails. So understanding how to go about that process in a way that will create change, um, that will be effective and uh, responsive to the needs of the community and the world. And the third part of the workshop was around how to introduce social entrepreneurship into higher education. Um, so looking at different kinds of curriculum and ways to uh, help the universities, help the students, faculty, community members, and business partners create a better world uh, for the community and, and, and beyond. Soy Jane Saldaña, responsable de la Unidad de Programas Académicos Nacionales de la CENACI. 
Durante dos días consecutivos hemos estado aquí reunidos eh, en este hotel de la localidad, académicos de eh, la mayor parte de las universidades acreditadas en, Pan en Panamá, estudiantes destacados que están interesados en el emprendedurismo, emprendedores y emprendedoras locales, emprendedores culturales eh, y miembros de Junior Achievement. Eh, hemos estado aquí reunidos eh, discutiendo y conversando sobre emprendedurismo social y también sobre el emprendedurismo, el ecosistema de innovación y eh, su impacto en eh, las nuevas tecnologías. Para eso eh, la CENACID a través del Washington Center ha recibido a dos destacados expositores internacionales, el ingeniero Michael O'Rourke, que es un emprendedor eh, que, cuya startup tiene su sede en Silicon Valley, y también a la académica, la doctora Melanie Freddy, eh, que también es una emprendedora social y que es profesora en la Universidad George Washington en Washington DC. Hemos estado discutiendo eh, un poco eh, qué se necesita para eh, llevar una idea innovadora hasta elevarlo a la categoría de un emprendimiento social que sea viable para el emprendedor y sostenible y que ayude a las comunidades en las cuales se encuentran. Este, este, esta, estas conversaciones han estado enmarcadas en el foro Emprendimiento, Emprendimiento Social e Innovación que forma parte de la iniciativa de eh, Innovación y Competitividad Panamá-Estados Unidos que lleva adelante la CENACID con el Washington Center, el Centro para Seminarios Académicos, el Washington Center con el cual eh, la CENACID tiene un convenio de colaboración y cuyos componentes son estos foros académicos, este foro se lleva a cabo por segundo año consecutivo y también eh, un, componente, un fuerte componente de desarrollo profesional en el cual eh, los estudiantes de las universidades acreditadas aquí en Panamá tienen la opción de participar en convocatorias para estar un semestre en los Estados Unidos tomando cursos académicos y también eh, formando parte del de el, el ecosistema emprendedor que tenemos en la capital de los Estados Unidos. Hello, my name is Sasha Gerhardson. I'm a senior manager with the Washington Center out of Washington, D.C. The Washington Center is a nonprofit that has been around since 1975, um, and we partner with universities all over the world to do um, internship programs in the Washington, D.C. area. The Washington Center has partnered with Sena Seats um, to offer several years of um, internship programs in the D.C. area. So, In 2018 and 2017, we selected 14 to 15 different Panamanian students that are eligible for the scholarship to come to the Washington, D.C. area and complete an internship in their field of study. Um, and then in addition to that, they take an evening course and they do Friday um, leadership development programming every week. And then at the end um, of this program, it culminates by um, they need to develop a proposal related to something that they can implement um, related to entrepreneurship back home in Panama. So at the end of the program, they present on their projects and then they come back to Panama and hopefully they can implement these projects on the ground here in Panama. Um, I know for a fact one alumni has already secured funding um, and she's launching something related to solar entrepreneurship here in Panama. Um, so we're super excited to be here in Panama City. We're currently um, participating in a forum. Um, that's the second year of the forum that's talking about social entrepreneurship, innovation, development, things like that. Um, and we're super happy to partner with NSC and we're super happy to be in Panama. <laughs> Hola, mi nombre es Michael, Michael O'Rourke. Eh, soy el CEO y fundador de Okra Labs, una compañía de tecnología en Silicon Valley, en California. Estoy muy agradecido de Senacid y del Washington Center por la invitación eh, a este evento en Panamá. Eh, los temas que estuve tratando eh, en estos últimos días están relacionando de dónde vienen las ideas y luego cómo se encuban esas ideas para producir eh, un producto. Eh, es la parte más importante del proceso de innovación donde la idea hay que darle vueltas y luego incubarla para que se produzca un, un producto. 
durante, el, eh, durante mi tiempo en Panamá y en el marco de esta conferencia, estuve también hablando con profesionales eh, e investigadores eh, panameños sobre la utilización de, las, de sus investigaciones para la creación de, de productos eh, con origen eh, panameño. Eh, las intervenciones estuvieron eh, bastante bien aceptadas y espero volver pronto a Panamá para continuar trabajando con ustedes.